Thank you all so much, Melanie. Thank you very much. I feel very old now, but <laughs> no, what's, what's funny is, um, whether it's delusional or not, I, I don't. I feel like I'm just getting started, which sounds bizarre for someone who has been doing this as long as I have. But the, the enthusiasm that I have, the interaction with the audience, the, the pleasure that I get from talking about the issues and speaking with the great guests, and most importantly, hanging out with our critics, is better today than it's ever been. And I want to just thank all of you because that's the reason this program, which is the largest conversation in Southern California, there is no bigger conversation than Air Talk. That's due to you. And I want to thank you so much for what you've done to support this program and make this possible. I also want to thank Margot and the American Cinematheque because when she approached us about doing the first show, it was very exciting. We had no idea what we were going to see in the way of, of turnout for the event. And it, we did it as an evening program, poured down rain, and I remember it was pretty harrowing getting home afterwards. And we had, considering the weather, an okay turnout, and it's only grown since then. So that each year, we have near sellout or sellout crowds coming out. So it's been wonderful to see your appreciation of our wonderful critics and what they're bringing. This year I'm particularly excited because this is a really wide open Oscar field. And I think we're gonna have some very spirited debates. So many of these movies are highly polarizing and you're gonna hear the critics vigorously defend or attack what they think was worthy or not. Let me first ask, just um, with applause, how many of you been to at least three of the 13 that we've done? Your applause? Great. Oh, wonderful. Well, we welcome you back, and for those of you who are here for your first time, we hope that you'll put it on your calendar and be a regular guest with us for the show. Uh, this is my favorite film week of the year because it's the greatest hits. It's everybody here together at one time to uh, share what they do. The critics put a tremendous amount of work into each week's show. They make it sound easy, but as you know, with the huge slate of films that comes out every week now, they are often seeing 12 to 15 films in a week. Can you imagine that kind of a pace? And not just on autopilot, but to think of things to say, uh, figure out you know, what your emotional reaction is, all of that. It's, it's a tremendous undertaking. And I appreciate them so much for their willingness to do this on your behalf. Well, getting to our show today, our format features five segments. It's about an hour and a half of programming. It will include time at the end for questions from a few members of the audience uh, so that if you have something you want to ask, one or more of the critics will ask you to line up at the microphone during our final break and have you come up to do that. And I'll give a little more details on that as we continue. Please silence your phone, although if you are a social media user, feel free to use it to tweet, uh, to post anywhere that you'd like to. You can take photographs, please no flash photography, but otherwise we love to have it an interactive experience with you. Let me just quickly introduce the team making this afternoon's program possible. Our managing editor is Colin Campbell. The senior producer of Air Talk is Lauren Osen. Uh, the producer of Film Week every Friday is Jasmine Tufaha. Our newest member of our team, producer Matt D'Angelo Antonio, with us today. And coordinating all the clips, he put a lot of work into getting these clips together for you, is Jeff Krynak, who's been with us, I think, from the very beginning of the programs. Dave McKeever, our engineer, uh, also uh, with us. Uh, our other engineers are, let's see, uh, I'll have that list for you shortly, but Leo Rodriguez, our head projectionist in the booth, Jesse Rodriguez helping on behalf of the Egyptian, Paul Rayton, and Mike Schleiger with us as well. Mike has been with us for many years. Barry Jones, the house manager. Uh, Xavier Carrico will be tweeting at Sid Grauman, which is the handle, appropriately enough, for the Egyptian theater. 
Uh, so thanks to all of our terrific team for all the work that they've put into our program. So just a couple things when we get into the show. Your applause is great because it makes it dynamic listening on radio. So I'll give you a little gesture just to hit the applause going into and out of our breaks because it makes it a lot more fun. People know, hey, I'm listening to a live broadcast on KPCC. So let's introduce our critics. First of all, we're splitting our panel in half, five critics in the first half, four critics in the second. We'll bring them all together for the audience participation. Our first critic isn't only a valuable asset to Film Week, but um, we really take advantage of him in many ways because he's the closest to us. I don't mean just in our heart, but he lives really close to the studios. So if, if we've, you know, some bombshell in the world of, of movies happens, Tim Cogshell is the man we call, and he's there, the man on the spot. He's live, he's local, he's late breaking, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, one of the things I like so much about our next critic is um, she's not only a strong analyst of film, uh, she's got great chops on that, but she is terrific at putting into words the emotional response that she has to film. And that's a real gift to be able to talk about that. Uh, she's a parent, as I am, and I appreciate how she's able to bring in a kid's perspective and reacting to news as well. And I appreciate her contribution so much. Leah Lowenstein. Now, every year I tease our next critic about his viciousness. And you know, I decide that's really enough. I'm going to lay off. We all know he's a hard ass. I don't, I don't need to uh, make a deal about it. So let me, let me just say, if I were a director and you were going to be the critic on the week my movie was coming out, it'd be Ray Milan's Lost Weekend for me. That's all I can all I can say. Um, seriously, one of the things I love about Henry is when he finds some sort of nuance to a film, something that you know, the average person that we just wouldn't see in a movie, he can pull that out, analyze it, take it to a part. I find myself just sitting there in the studio like a listener, not hosting the show, because I'm learning so much. It is like a master class in cinema. Henry Sheehan. She is our newest critic, and you can read her outstanding reviews in the LA Weekly, but it's even more fun, I think, to hear her talk about it. She's animated, she's fun, she's got just a, a great spontaneity about her approach to reviewing films on the program. Amy Nicholson. Now, our final critic for this panel has just received a very prestigious honor from the International Animated Film Society. That's the group that gives out the Annie's, the top award for animation each year. And this is judged by people in the animation industry. This is an honor from peers. They also bestow what's known as the June Foray Award. You may know it's incredible um, voice talent, Rocky the Squirrel, but more great voices than you can imagine uh, came from the mouth of June Foray. Uh, the Foray, Foray Award is given each year to someone who makes a tremendous contribution to the field of animation. And that is, without question, a man we're very proud to have with us almost every week now, given the number of animated films. Author, critic, historian, Charles Solomon. All right, we're going to begin with a couple of clips from films that relate to our first two categories, and then we'll go right into starting the recorded portion of the program, which you'll be able to hear if you want to hear the show that you're seeing Friday at 11.30 on KPCC. Now, we begin with one of the five nominees for Best Animated Feature, Song of the Sea. In Song of the Sea, young Sersha was born under mysterious circumstances as her mother disappeared right after giving birth. Uh, 
Circe is a little girl who can't speak and seems drawn to the water. It's soon revealed she's a Selkie, part human, part seal. Selkies are Irish mythological figures. In this scene from Song of the Sea, Circe is in peril. She's disappeared, and her brother is looking for her at the home of the old and scary magical owl, Maka. Next is one of the eight nominees for Best Picture. Boyhood has a total of eight nominations. Writer-director Richard Linklater took 12 years to make the movie. He filmed the actors as they aged, coming back every year or so to shoot. There's no plot. It's just the story of a boy and his sister being raised by a sometimes single, sometimes married mom and the biological father who has weekend visitation. In this scene, the boy of boyhood, young Eller Coltrane, is telling his mom, played by Patricia Arquette, who's Oscar nominated, how unhappy he is about his stepfather forcing him to get a haircut. All right. One of the favorites, I think, for the Best Picture Oscar, Boyhood, but we'll find out what our critics think about that a little bit later. So feel free to respond to what the critics have to say. If you agree with what they say, feel free to applaud. You can cheer. Uh, booing is, you know, <laughs> S save it they're for sensitive. Henry. They're sensitive. They can dish it out, but... <laughs> Be cautious. Uh, have a good time. No, let it go and, and share, because... My guess is when we do our poll at the end of this to find out what your favorites are, we're going to get a pretty wide spread because of the open field. So have at it. Thanks again. We're going to start rolling. Let me know, gentlemen, when we're ready to roll tape. All right. From the historic Egyptian theater on Hollywood Boulevard, this is the 13th Annual Film Week Academy Awards Preview. I'm Larry Mantle with nine of our Film Week critics ready to make their cases for who should win the major categories in this year's Oscars. The awards take place Sunday, February 22nd, just down the street at the Dolby Theater. Our team of critics for the first few categories are Tim Cockshell, <laughs> Leo Lowenstein, Henry Sheehan, Amy Nicholson, and Charles Solomon. All right, we begin with the best animated feature category, and the nominees here are Disney's Big Hero 6, The Box Trolls from Leica Studios in Oregon, How to Train Your Dragon 2, DreamWorks production, Song of the Sea, an Irish film, uh, and the tale of Princess Kaguya from Japanese animator Isao Takahata. All right, let's start right away. Charles, let me begin with you as our animation authority. These five nominees, which one your favorite? Um, hard to say because four of the five, I think, are really strong films that indicate the state of the art form and how it's developing. There's one, I think, as a dud that Amy and I will go to the mat over subsequently. <laughs> it's the box uh, trolls. I yeah. love the box trolls. <laughs> and I hated it. But with Dragon and Big Hero, you have two strong studio CG films. Uh, I would argue that Dragon is the stronger and seems the favorite at this point after it won the Annies and the Golden Globe. Uh, very, very well told story. I don't know why uh, Big Hero 6, Kaguya, and uh, Song of the Sea weren't nominated for things like production design when they're so beautiful. Song of the Sea and Princess Kaguya are exquisite foreign hand-drawn films. So there is a real uh, breadth to this category that we haven't seen in a long time that makes it very interesting. Again, I'm not a fan of box trolls as Amy was, uh, there was a big kerfuffle when the nominations were announced and the uh, Lego movie wasn't included uh, because it was the biggest moneymaker of the year in animation and had gotten More than very that, good it was reviews. really good. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I yeah. mean, what I think probably counted against it is uh, it came out early in the year. It's about 15 minutes too long. It's product-based, which I don't think the Academy would go for, although we've come a long way from... He-Man and the Masters of the Universe and Strawberry Shortcake. Uh, and it's not really about too much of anything. I think that um, the other nominees have generally stronger stories. 
uh, have okay. more of more emotional strength as well as just uh, visual beauty. Well, we'll come back for more. So, Amy, since we've got this going right here, what defend yeah. box trolls? Let me defend box trolls because I think box trolls is the best film in this entire category. Oh, jeez! I, it, I think it has the strongest <laughs> script out of all of them. I uh, mean, box trolls is really a smart film for children because. The story that it tells isn't just one about finding your inner strength or how everybody's a hero on the inside, which pretty much every animated feature a lot of the times falls into that trap. It's a film about uh, stereotyping and demonization and about a town where everybody hates these box trolls for no reason other than that they've been told that they're scary. And, and they I think scary. it's a really complicated film for children. <laughs> they are scary, but then they're but, sweet. But doesn't, but doesn't it? Oh, I'm sorry. Good. But what the film has in it is that the bad guys in the box trolls actually start questioning whether or not they're doing the right thing. And it's a film that teaches children that maybe people who do the bad thing actually don't mean to, and, every, and they think what they're doing is right. It's not a film that is in, in black and white. It's a really complicated gray film for children, and I adore it. All right, those of you but on the left couch, who wants to jump in here? You know, Wait, I'm, 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 well, no, I'm Charles, I'm hold, think, hold on, because right, i got to right. get everybody else in. I, Go I ahead. think Amy makes a compelling case for box trolls, and I hadn't thought of it that way, Amy, so you've helped me to reconsider it. However, I didn't care for it, really, and um, <laughs> I do think there's really nothing wrong with, you know, a film about finding your hero on the inside, which is really what Big Hero 6 was about, and my kids really connected to it. I liked it a lot. I would have liked to see the Lego movie in this list. Um, didn't love How to Train Your Dragon 2 nearly as much as the first one. I'm sort of surprised that so many people thought it was terrific, but, um, you know, and Song of the Sea I thought was beautiful. Yeah, so. be a beautiful film. Yeah, yeah. Tim? I, well, I, look, uh, uh, the, the big movies, the big studio movies, all suffer from the same thing. Too much drawing. Too many frames. These people should draw less. <laughs> they save money and make a better movie. That's like saying a talk show host should talk less. <laughs> I'm so very offended by that. Song of the Sea, on the other hand, and Princess Kaguya for that matter, are films that you can put on and turn the sound down. Mm -hmm. And you will be happy every time you look at the screen. That's true. It, when those films come out on Blu-ray, and, and you'll probably have isolated soundtracks, you'll be able to put them on and leave the soundtrack up, and you'll be happy orally and watching, because they're just insanely, beautifully hand-drawn films uh, that are just mellifluous in the way that they flow. Those other movies are energetic, and they're fun, and all of that kind of stuff, but I, they're all out of my mind right now. I can't think of what happens in any of those Henry, films. quick closing thought on animation. Well, I just w one thing to say about Box Trolls is I, I I like stop motion animation a lot, so I'm biased in, in that direction. And I thought the character animation in that movie was exceptional. I mean, just by the movements of, of the figures, I, I, I just saw a lot of meaning, a lot of emotion. But I do think by far the best animated film of the year is The Tale of Princess Kaguya. I mean, that was, that is just gorgeous exquisite, film. gorgeous, and so full of emotion. I mean, if, if, if I were ever to cry at the end of a movie, and I never would, that, <laughs> that, that would be one I would. Um, why, why are we not shocked, Henry? Uh, um, all right, um, we'll, we'll, yeah, I gotta move on to our next category, which is Best Supporting Actress. You can make comment in the final segment, Charles. All right. Here the nominees are, from Boyhood, Patricia Arquette, Wild Laura Dern, The Imitation Games Kira Knightley, Emma Stone from Birdman, and Into the Week Woods uh, Oscar Perennial Meryl Streep. All right, who wants to lead off on a supporting actress? Um, can I ask why Meryl is in there? I mean, in the original. Broadway production, it was Bernadette Peters who can actually sing the songs, <laughs> uh, which you would think you would want for someone in a musical. And yeah, she looks okay. great with purple hair, but. But out of this field, who it. would you take? Um, Patricia Arquette. <laughs> All right. I'm, 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 I'm going to agree with Charles about Patricia Arquette, and this is why. So the gimmick of, 12, uh, uh, of uh, Boyhood set aside, that 12 year thing, Tr Patricia's performance is absolutely true and very, very true to the moment that it's in. So think about that for a second. Um, she brings to the screen 
the realness of the moment of, an, of, of, of situations that happened 12 years before, a year before, three years before, whatever. She gets right back to that moment and sits right on top of it. Every, all verisimilitude yeah. out of her, L every L word. It is a very authentic performance, and I do think she deserves to win, and I hope she does. However, Henry and I were talking about that this is really much more of a lead performance than a supporting performance. Yeah, and yeah I think yeah. that's a good it's, point. It's, it's too bad that she got stuck in this category, because I think it's... She, carries the picture a lot. And, and I understand, I, Ethan Hawke is in Best Supporting Actor, so I, this sounds very political to me. I, I think Patricia Arquette's going to win largely because of that last scene she has, you know, where she talks about what her don't, life don't, is. Don't, don't, well, don't, yeah. Spoiler <laughs> alert, spoiler alert. And, it, you know, where she jumps in the tank and just kills everybody around her. <laughs> <laughs> You saw the extended director's cut. Uh, uh, yeah, so you think she, it's hers? I, th I think it's hers, yeah. Amy? Yeah, I think it's Patricia Arquette's as well, but mainly because while everybody else on this ballot is a really tremendous actor, I find these nominations strange because none of these characters in any of these films are given anything to do. Laura Dern is just sweet through all of the film. Keira Knightley is plucky. Emma Stone is just sort of a mess. Like None of these characters have arcs, really, except for Patricia Arquette, so I find the category a little bewildering. All right, so now it's time for an audience vote. You applauded them, but now think hard. You're voting for one of the five, your best supporting actress, Patricia Arquette, Boyhood. Do we need to go further? Uh, Laura Dern Wild? Couple. Kira Knightley, Imitation Game? Emma Stone, Birdman? That's a core of real intense loyalty. And Meryl Streep, Into the Woods? I know, we all love Meryl, but not in that role. Okay, Patricia Arquette, Birdman it is. We'll continue from the Egyptian Theater, 13th Annual. Film Week on Air Talk Academy Awards preview. Back with more right after this update. All right, very good. Charles, I promise we will come okay. back. Okay. No, I think that's a, I think that's a good point. Okay. He just won a lifetime achievement award because his head is full of so much animation expertise. Um, okay, we are going to go to. Uh, let's see our next group of uh, clips that we've got. Mm -hmm. The Best Picture nominee, The Grand Budapest Hotel, from writer-director Wes Anderson, the story of a legendary concierge who's responsible for guest experiences at the Grand Budapest. That responsibility includes the one he's taken on to entertain the wealthy older women who come to visit at the hotel. Um, in this scene, one of the women has died. Concierge Gustav H., played by Ray Fiennes, has gone to the woman's palatial home to pay his respects and perhaps to receive something from her will. He finds out that she thought quite highly of Gustav and willed him her most valuable possession, a famed painting. Here, Fiennes is greeted rather rudely by the woman's son, played by Adrian Brody. As with several of our clips today, it is very profane. With a number of these films, there was no way to get away from it. Uh, so my apologies. I love it that of the eight nominees for Best Picture, three of them have comedic elements that are a big part of them, even if they're darker, darker themes. Uh, yeah, so nine total nominations for Grand Budapest Hotel, which for a comedy I think is pretty impressive. Uh, now, this um, is a year for Best Picture nominees with humor. Uh, I'm a big fan of dark comedies like Birdman. Uh, Best Actor nominee Michael Keaton plays a former star of a superhero franchise who is no longer bankable. He's self-producing, directing, and starring in a Broadway play based on his adaptation of Raymond Carver's stories. And he's hoping it'll bring him notice as a real actor. When one of his actors is hit by a stage light and injured, in comes critically acclaimed Broadway star played by Edward Norton. And Norton doesn't respect Keaton much. You see, punching is a theme in our clips this year. Uh, Birdman has nine Oscar nominations, uh, in, in, uh, including Best Picture, and of course, Michael Keaton for Best Actor. So we're going to get back to our segment two of our recording. Gentlemen, just as soon as you're ready. We're all set? Okay.
Welcome back to the home of the first ever Hollywood premiere, Sid Grauman's 1922 showplace, the Egyptian Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. It's the 13th Annual Film Week Academy Awards Preview. Our critics are Charles Solomon, Henry Sheehan, Leah Lowenstein, Tim Cogshell, and Amy Nicholson. Our next category is Best Original Screenplay. We have Birdman with four credited writers, Boyhood, writer-director Richard Linklater, Foxcatcher, and the two writers are Max Fry and Dan Futterman, Grand Budapest Hotel, the director is the writer Wes Anderson, and Nightcrawler screenwriter Dan Gilroy. So for best original screenplay, who wants to start this category? I'll, I'll start. Henry? Okay, I'll, I, I think there are two outstanding screenplays in this group. They're both completely different kinds of screenplays, and I, I think they both work equally well. Um, the one I think people will like is the Grand Budapest Hotel. You rarely see a writer able to bring off a whimsical conception with exclusively um, eccentric characters, and each of the eccentric characters are highly differentiated. They don't share a, a bunch of ticks. The other one I think is great is Nightcrawler. Uh, it's corrosive satire, maybe not recognize as satire because it's not a satirical comedy, but it's so biting, it takes on, I would say, sacred and unsacred cows in our society very effectively, and I just think those two tower over the other there, three. There, there are these things that happen in Nightcrawler, and I don't know whether these are things that are in the screenplay or things that were filmmaker decisions, you know, Jake or whatnot, but there are all kinds of things that happen in the movie that are very movie things, things that only happen in movies. Uh, and, and that's what undermines that screenplay for me, if those things are in the screenplay. But they play out in the movie in that very, very particular way. But I agree with Henry in, in general, but you know, it sort of manifests itself. Uh, Grand Budapest, absolutely fantastic, and there's a certain weight in all of it. It's so funny, this movie is hysterical. Yet there's a certain weight in all of this that speaks to something, and I don't even know what it's speaking to when I watch this movie. Is it, is it, is it, is it something to do with the Holocaust? I don't know what it is, there's a darkness, a weight, yet I'm giggling all the way through that movie. Um, for me, it's Birdman. Seen a different the, the Birdman is the film, I think, that ultimately is the, uh, the extraordinary screenplay. There's all kinds of stuff going on over here uh, in that movie. It's about all kinds of very interesting things, too. And then there's all that technical stuff that I, he has to make work inside yeah. that very yeah, okay. complicated so I screenplay. Don't, you know, I, I, I liked Birdman a lot, but I think its strength was really more its technical accomplishment. And it, I thought uh, Michael Keaton was tremendous in it. However, um, that would not be my pick. Uh, for screenplay, I would go with Grand Budapest Hotel because to me this is Wes Anderson really working at the top of his game and it's as if he's taken everything that he's done up until now and sort of created you know, the, the greatest and the most perfect, the apotheosis of Wes Anderson is, is Grand Budapest Hotel. It's like, this is him doing what he does, what no one else can do in that way. And, and uh, so that's why it was terrific. Boyhood, I think, you know, not really even having, it does have a screenplay, but it, it was so much more improvisatory and collaborative that really Grand Budapest gets my vote in this a category. Amy, what do you think? Yeah, I've never felt closer to Henry than when he just singled out Nightcrawler and Grand Budapest Hotel because those two does are Does that scare you? Far. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. But those two are by far greater than anything, anything in here. I think Birdman, you know, the ending when Patricia Arquette comes out with a tank and kills everybody, the, the ending of Birdman just bunts. It has no idea what it wants to say. I, and I think Foxcatcher, as much as I admire the acting in it, Foxcatcher has no idea who its protagonist is. Well, see, it like I, shifts characters, drops people in the last third of the movie. That, it's that, very clumsy and strange. That third act of Birdman, to me, was so clear about what, what, what the film wanted to say. There's a moment in Birdman, I'm not going to ruin it either, when you know all the explosions, uh, but, but when, <laughs> when, when, when I absolutely and completely understand exactly what that movie is about, and it's amazing to me because it's speaking to me, and I have nothing to do with the theater or anything like that. Uh, you don't have to be from that world in order for what that movie is speaking to but you it, to just land on you. But it there didn't is, speak to a lot of people. I, I think apparently. there is a huge problem with Birdman, which is that you know, it's, it's, I like that it takes surrealistic leaps. I like that it gets a little crazy, but I think the problem with the script is that only works if we are aware that we're watching Birdman through the eyes of Michael Keaton as he grows increasingly unhinged. And what this film does that makes no sense is it shoehorns in this romantic subplot with Emma Stone and Edward Norton, and as soon as the camera in this, like, 
single track determination of it leaves Michael Keaton and goes with the other's characters, we lose the idea that this is his idea of what's happening in the world around him. And then I don't think the film can pull off things that it wants to do anymore, any of that imaginative crazy, uh, crazy leaps. Well, I, I a lot of, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, what I found so weird about Birdman is I haven't people talk about the theater like that since <laughs> stage door uh, in about 1935. And I guess I saw that, a different- but that was a good movie. Though. Yes, that <laughs> was. Um, and I guess I saw a different cut of Grand Budapest Hotel as I thought it was the most pointless thing I've sat through in years. It's like listening to a, it's like listening to a sonata for harpsichord and dog whistle. I, I, one, thing, one thing about the screenplay for Birdman, a lot of that dialogue is, um, it's just really filler really to, to help you know, fill up the soundtrack as these people are, are walking around with this moving camera. You know, I mean, there's a, a lot of that, you know, people alone going, you know, F this and G this and all, all that. I mean, it, it, it doesn't mean anything. We already know that about the people, you know, and, and, but, you know, we want, we have to have something on the soundtrack while we're going through all these hallways and this Times Square and whatever. Okay. Well, and another thing about Birdman, really quick, we are all critics here. Can we ad at least admit that the critic in the screenplay is the most insane version of what a critic is actually like? Yeah. It's pretty insulting. But we yeah. know some of those people. <laughs> we're like, I'm going to break you I, in real life. Are you looking I at Henry? Right? Leo, we don't talk about that. <laughs> I, wish we could, I wish I could write some of my reviews in a bar like that. I'd feel yeah. better. I, <laughs> all right, I, okay. I always watch at least the trailer before the, I review. We need, we, need to, we need to wrap the uh, best original screenplay. So real quickly, down the line, Charles, your pick for this? Um, I'd pass. Okay. <laughs> Amy? I want this to go to Nightcrawler just because it's the only thing it's nominated in, which I find to be a real shame. I think Renee Russo should have been in Best Supporting. Lael? Budapest. Budapest. Henry? Well, still a tie, Budapest and Nightcrawler. All right. And I'm a Birdman fan. All right. So now your chance to vote members of our audience uh, for Birdman and its writers. Richard Linklater for Boyhood. Fox Catchers, Max Fry, Dan Futterman. Grand Budapest Hotel's Wes Anderson. Nightcrawler, Dan Gilroy. All right, underdog vote there. Let's move on to Best Actor. Here the nominees are Steve Carell for Fox Catcher, Bradley Cooper, American Sniper, Benedict Cumberbatch for The Imitation Game, Michael Keaton for Birdman, and Eddie Redmayne for The Theory of Everything. So, Leo, you wanna start us on this? Yes, and I think Amy and I have a couple things to say about this too, because there are so many great performances that weren't even nominated, uh, chief of which would be, I would say, Tom Hardy in the film Locke, that, um, about three people saw, but but you all should They're go. all here, though. Yeah. This is, <laughs> they're but, all here. But what a performance. I mean, that is a career-defining moment, and unfortunately, there's not enough slots here. Uh, also, David Oyelowo in Selma, not nominated, was terrific. <laughs> Ray Fiennes was excellent. Chadwick Boseman in Get On Up. I mean, there were a lot of great performances of Jake those. Jake Gyllenhaal in Nightcrawler. J absolutely, Jake Gyllenhaal. And, you know, every year it seems like the the Academy sort of scrambles to try to find five women that it can that it can stick in the in the best actress category, but there's there's a glut of best actor possibilities, and that's unfortunate. It, d it doesn't feel and, fair. And that's a whole other segment about why yeah. Uh, yeah. that disparity in gender. Amy, you want to weigh in this category? Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I love every name on the list. I love that you also named Chick Chadwick Boseman and Get On Up, who as James Brown, I think that was really one of the and standout performances no of the was, year. He was terrific. Yeah, mm -hmm. nobody even paid attention to him. And, and there are a lot of there are no some performances here. Not to get catty, I would swap out in a heartbeat. I would absolutely swap out Benedict Cumberbatch from this list for any one of those names because I don't think that script gave him very much to do. Mm -hmm. Well, and I don't, I don't think Turing was a high-functioning uh, uh, auti yeah. autism victim. Well, if I you look quite this, agree with you. If yeah. you look at this list, most of these people, Steve and Bradley and Benedict, they're all playing somebody. They're all playing people for whom there were templates. And if they, you know, they, they, they do the job and, the, and look at the video and, and achieve the template of the person they're playing, that's, that's great and, and, and it's good work. Michael Keaton isn't playing anyone else. He's playing the character in the film. And he's not even playing Michael Keaton, which he, he knows that all of us thinks that he is. 
uh, which is this other layer that he has to well, affect in How do we know that it isn't? Yeah, yeah, well, how does he know? Yeah, it isn't? yeah, yeah maybe the bird <laughs> How do we know who any of us really are? So that's to me, it's Michael Keaton. That's the performance that, that I think is interesting. interesting. He's the after one guy that's playing somebody that's not somebody else. Well, you know, you the, sometimes the best actor award is the best bellowing award, and I think that's why Michael Keaton's going to win it this year. I I think in the gr in the group that that's here, I I think that easily Bradley Cooper gives the best performance be because it doesn't seem to be a performance in any way whatsoever. And, the, and if you look back at the history of, of American film, you notice that these actors are the ones who never get recognized unless they eventually do a film that's a complete self-parody like John Wayne did in True Grit. And then, you know, he get, you know, doesn't get recognized for Fort Apache or The Searchers, but for True Grit. I think the best performance of the year is Ray Fiennes, and that th this is, he's suffering from what's called the Cary Grant syndrome, mm -hmm. and, and that is if you Too do pretty? a, a light, no, he, <laughs> well first of all, you know, Cary Grant never won a Best Actor award, he, do, he got a Lifetime Achievement Award, and it's if you do something that's called, unfortunately called light comedy, you don't get nominated and you don't get recognized, I wish they would take that word light and get rid of it. It's almost like a technical term, more, more than a description of what the actor does. And I, I think for f Fines to sustain that bizarre character for the whole length of a feature film and to you know, be in every okay. scene like that is monumental. Comedy okay. is seldom uh, recognized in the acting categories. Though, so let's so. quickly get your votes on, on this. Uh, Tim, what's your pick, uh, best uh, actor? Uh, Michael Keaton is still gonna stand out. Okay, me. Henry. Bradley Cooper. All right, Michael Lale? Keaton. I'm going to go Eddie Romaine. Um, I find myself siding with Amy because I expected Steve Carell to light his nose like Lucy did when she was talking to John Wayne. <laughs> All right, best act now. Let's ask each of you. Eddie Redmayne, Theory of Everything. <laughs> Michael Keaton, Birdman. <laughs> Benedict Cumberbatch, The Imitation Game. Bradley Cooper, American Sniper. Steve Carell, Foxcatcher. I think Michael Keaton edged that one out. All right, best actor. We move to the best director category. Four of the five have their films nominated for best picture as well. Uh, but one of them, Bennett Miller, a Foxcatcher, his movie wasn't, wasn't nominated. Uh, so he's won, uh, Bennett Miller, Alejandro Iñárritu for Birdman, Richard Linklater for Boyhood, Wes Anderson, Grand Budapest Hotel, and Morton Tildum for The Imitation Game. Let's see, why don't we start with uh, you, Charles, and this. Who do you think was the best director this year? Um, I never thought I would say this after sitting through Waking Life, but I would go for uh, Linklater. I think Anderson is the emperor's new filmmaker, and I was not wowed by the other... Um, as I expected to be, having heard so much about them from my fellow critics. I sat through a lot of live action for this show. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and did you learn to like it a little bit, at least? Yeah. Those real people, I know they can be off-putting. They're not uh, Amy, nearly as what, much fun. <laughs> Amy, what, what was your choice? Um, I do have a ton of problems with Foxcatcher, but I think what Bennett Miller does with his actors here is really tremendous. He's not my pick, but I do think what he does with Channing Tatum in Foxcatcher is unbelievable. I think that this is really an actor's movie, and he brings out great performances in them. That said, I have never been a Wes Anderson fan. I've never gotten it. And all of a sudden, with Grand Budapest Hotel, his entire career makes sense for me. I've always thought Really? He, so yeah. the previous ones you may like now? No, I'm not going to go that far. <laughs> but I always thought, especially like at his nadir with Darjeeling Limited, he's just a filmmaker who makes things that are incredibly beautiful and lifeless. But here with Grand Budapest, what he does is he takes this beautiful world and then he sets it right before uh, the collapse of it, right before World War II and then the rise of communism, which he sort of clearly calls common property. And all of a sudden, knowing that th this world he's created is going to get destroyed really makes us side with him in the fight to create beauty in the world and to maintain something special. And all of a sudden, I understand what he's been fighting for. And so this is the first of his movies I've ever thought was mature and grown up. And I just, I love what he's doing here. He's absolutely my pick. Great. Leo, what do you think? I think Amy just made me think about Grand Budapest Hotel <laughs> in a whole new way. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't seen it that, should, the, the that West deeply. Anderson but I, hire I, you. I like it a lot. Um, you, make, you make a good point. I'm, I... I also have to give some props to 
Iñárritu because I thought it, it was an extraordinary achievement to kind of choreograph, coordinate, and and consider this entire world of Birdman. I thought he did a, a wonderful job. Yeah. However, I also want to say Linklater for the 12 years of, of this achievement. I mean, it's it's unprecedented and unparalleled in, in narrative feature filmmaking, and I would give it to him for that reason. All right, Henry. The only director I think uh, deserves it and who's not going to get it, doesn't have a chance, is Wes Anderson. Um, there's so much stuff we can talk about this, this movie. I mean, just the change in the aspect ratios. Every time the movie goes to another uh, his, his time of uh, history, the aspect ratio changes to reflect how movies were made. They go from 235, which is cinemascope, down to 133, the, the old Hollywood standard, almost square shape. Uh, th that kind of stuff is clever. Uh, he he's re he hasn't adapted a Stefan Zweig novel, but he has, you know, evoked that world of those writers, those Viennese writers, and he's established the kind of elevated nostalgia. Now he's no Ernst Lubitsch, but he has established that romantic nostalgia that Lubitsch used for a world that was gone and no longer existed, and. Lubitsch did that realistically, but remember, he's also the filmmaker who said he preferred Paris Paramount to Paris France, <laughs> and all, the, all those things are, are in this movie. Yeah, uh, this, uh, Tim? I, 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 I look, Inaritu is my choice here, because he pulls off all the technical stuff, that's for sure, and the technical stuff is extraordinary and very difficult to do, but he does not sacrifice narrative to do it. He doesn't force what the people and the characters are doing and what they are going for and trying to achieve to, to, to fit into what he's trying to do technically. So when we're walking around with him, uh, he is in service to character. Now, who should win this award is a director named J.C. Chandor, who directed a movie that's not nominated called The Most Violent Year. Um, and J.C. Chandor is just an extraordinary director. That movie just fell, I don't know what, but if you haven't seen The Most Violent Year, it's probably one of the better films of the year. Also not nominated here, of course, is Ava DuVernay for her film, which is nominated, Selma. Selma. Uh, this is another extra extraordinary achievement of what she has done. With less than half the money and less than half the time of any of these other directors, she made a film that is just as good, if not better. All right, we'll come back with our critics. Many more categories, including Best Picture, Best Actress, and much more. It's Film Week on Air Talk from the uh, Egyptian Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, 13th Annual Academy Awards Preview. We'll be back right after this. And we go. All right. Yes, you folks, just be careful there. And we're going to bring up our next group of critics. Thank you all very much. You know, one of the things I love is, is the regard that they have for each other and the respect. And, and I just sit back sometimes, watch them go back and forth, and I just feel like it's, it's a clinic for me. I've learned so much about movies from listening to all of our critics. And you heard it here, just all the different perspectives. It's... it's Really interesting, and Leo, like when she said about Amy, I, I hadn't thought of it that way about Anderson and, and his films. All right, we are going to uh, see some more uh, clips momentarily, but first let me bring up the second group of critics. Our, our first one here, he's been with us from virtually the beginning. He's written for many of Los Angeles' top publications on film. He is our resident time travel expert, uh, Hong Kong action film expert. He is a true movie enthusiast of all kinds of genres. He writes for the LA Times Marquee Community Papers, Andy Klein. Next up is, is a man who perhaps has the greatest voice of anyone on KPCC, and he only is with us once a month for Film Week. Uh, he uh, it comes from a Hollywood family, which is interesting. His father had an acting school in downtown Los Angeles on Figueroa back in the 30s. And uh, in fact, uh, Rita Hayworth's father was the dancing teacher, he was telling me, at his, his father's uh, dance school. Wade Major. 
IGN's DigiGods. And back with us, she was traveling last year with family and not able to join us, and it just, it just felt incomplete without her being part of the family. She is a terrific critic. She writes for USA Today and uh, can converse on just all different kinds of films. A delight to have on our team, Claudia Puig. And finally, a uh, uh, critic for the Christian Science Monitor, author of Rainer on Film, which is a terrific uh, compilation of some of his best reviews about some of the most important and forgotten films in movie history. Uh, he is also the man who has so many frequent film festival credits, they're going to have to name a festival in his honor at some point. He was just telling us on our last show about the Santa Barbara Festival, but he's everywhere. Who knew they had a uh, a, a film festival in Bermuda. Peter found it. <laughs> Everybody has to wear shorts. But all right, Peter Rayner. Stole my joke. <laughs> all right, and we have two more of our clips to go for uh, before we start. Rory Kennedy's last days in Vietnam. Uh, says it all right in the title of the movie. She combines archival film of Americans and South Vietnamese being evacuated from the U.S. Embassy in Saigon with present-day interviews to tell this very dramatic story. Much of, of this story I had never heard about before. Uh, one of those was the departure of ships and helicopters out of Saigon Harbor just as the North Vietnamese Army was ready to roll in. One of the U.S. ships had helicopters landing on the deck. They'd push the helicopters over the side of the ship, and then the next chopper would land. People get out, boom, they dump it in the water. Uh, however, there was no room for a massive Chinook helicopter that was full of South Vietnamese refugees. It would have heavily damaged the ship to land it on the ship uh, deck. Instead, the South Vietnamese pilot hovered over the water for everyone inside to jump into the water and swim to safety. It's incredible. They were all rescued by the adjacent ship's crew. All that was left for the pilot of the Chinook to figure a way out. I, I was riveted by this film. It's one of the five Oscar nominees for Best Feature Documentary. And Rory Kennedy, the director of the, the film, who also did Ghosts of Abu Ghraib, is the youngest daughter of Robert and Ethel Kennedy. Uh, I, I believe that um, she was in the womb as, as her father was assassinated. So Vietnam also, you know, obviously had real resonance for her in telling this story. And the helicopter stills and the film, some guy who was on this U.S. ship had it just sitting in his attic. He had had uh, this Super 8 camera. He was just shooting all this stuff when this took place. And I'd never seen it on television before, but it, it's a big centerpiece of the film Last Days in Vietnam. Uh, well, Whiplash features J.K. Simmons in his Oscar-nominated Best Supporting Actor role. He is the intense uh, teacher at an elite music school. He leads the top jazz band there. Miles Teller plays a freshman drummer who's been hand-picked to play in the teacher's top jazz band. Uh, a lot of dark comedy in Whiplash. Uh, nominated for Best Picture and for other Oscars. All right, we're ready to continue with our recorded program. All set, okay. From the historic Egyptian theater on Hollywood Boulevard, this is the 13th annual Film Week Academy Awards preview. I'm Larry Mantle with our next panel of critics, Andy Klein, Wade Major, Claudia Puig, and Peter Rayner. Our next category is Best Documentary Feature. The nominees here are Citizen Four from Laura Poitras, 
Finding Vivian Meyer by John Maloof and Charlie Siskel, Last Days in Vietnam by Rory Kennedy, The Salt of the Earth by Vim Vendors and Juliano Riviero Salgado, and Virunga Orlando von Einsendel. All right, well, let's take a look at this category. Peter, you want to start us off here. Which, which stands out to you of the five? Well, I think uh, they're all worthy. Uh, I think Citizen Four is, is an important movie, not so much as a piece of documentary filmmaking, but as a kind of get. You know, they, I mean, who knew that Edward Snowden looked like a grad student uh, in a T-shirt, you know, holed up in a hotel room and, you know, earth-shattering uh, revelations? Uh, I think it's, it's a fascinating movie, and, and I, I think the people who made it uh, deserve some credit for henceforth having their entire life encrypted in order to get get by. Uh, and I, Peter, just before you go on, get, yeah. just briefly describe at what point is this that they're talking with, uh, with him about uh, his whole decision to go public with what he accessed? Well, they, uh, you know, he, he has all of this information about uh, secret spying and the NSA and, and they uh, don't initially, uh, the director doesn't really even know who's providing these these emails initially, and then it turns out it's him, and they arrange for this meeting, and they're in Hong Kong and uh, leave Germany and so forth. So it's 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 an eye opener that we already have had our eyes open to. Um, the film leaves some hints at the end that there are bigger revelations to come, and so far that hasn't happened. So I don't know if that was the the art house documentary equivalent of a teaser trailer <laughs> for the sequel, um, but you know I think it's sort of fascinating to sort of be in you know, literally uh, inside of the room with these people uh, after having read so much about this stuff in the news. I'm sorry, yeah, I've, I've, Claudia, I've we been, couldn't hear you. In, in all of the many festivals that I've been to, I've been in hotel rooms just like that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying you felt the claustrophobia in that hotel room, too, because it was not just Laura Poitras and Edward Snowden. There was a reporter... Glenn Greenwald. Uh, yes, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald. Greenwald yeah, and, and another reporter that came at another time. But but you know you knew that he couldn't leave, obviously. So that you just you felt yeah. the tension. So which powerfully. which was your favorite of these five? I, you know I think they're really really strong. Um, and there isn't one on there that I don't admire. But my favorite was Virunga, actually. She tells um, story of of the mountain gorillas. Stories. Well, yeah, I thought I was going into it seeing a story of the mountain gorillas, which it was. But it was also a story about the Congo and the you know. Internecine warfare there, the the revolution, you know, the, the war that was going on and saving the mountain gorillas. And there's only two places that have mountain gorillas. It's this it's Virunga National Forest, and then I think someplace in Uganda as well. And the affection that some of the rangers at this national park developed with the gorillas was extremely moving. Yes, it's really touching, particularly yes. when you hear the history of those of those men, and particularly the the person who's primarily responsible for the well-being of the gorillas that are in their nursery. Yes. You know, the other thing is, it was so dramatic when you saw the, the workers risking their lives to try and protect this national forest, the oldest in Africa, as and Africa, they're standing as, there with their little rifles with these rebels about ready to come in. It's rebels talk about with their bravery. tanks and their AK-47s, yeah. It was a really powerful film. I, I think, you know, I was, I'd was i already seen all the others at that point. I love Salt of the Earth. I thought that was beautiful. Um, I thought Citizen Four was really important. I was fascinated by, by finding Vivian Mayer. Um, and then I saw this one, and I just thought, wow. This is just something I knew nothing about, and it really captured what was going on in Africa so well. Wade? So, it, it, this has been a great year for documentaries. Tim and I were talking beforehand. There are another five to ten films that could have been nominated, and all of them would possibly have been winners in any other year. Uh, Citizen Four stands out here. What we have are five nominees. Two of them are about wonderful photographers. Three are political and current events films. And usually, uh, unless you have a year like Sugar Man, it's the current events, the political stuff, the conscience films, those are the ones that always win out. And here, what, what sets Citizen Four apart is the other movies are all filmmaker movies. Citizen Four is a journalist movie. And it's the only one that's not about something. It is the thing that it's about. It becomes part of its own story. Laura Poitras puts herself on the line in a way that documentarians rarely do. Uh, she becomes part of the story. She puts herself at risk. And she doesn't know where the story's going. 
she kind of follows it like a journalist. And there's, a, there's, a, there's an amazing courage to that. And the way that the film is constructed so as to communicate the process by which the film came to be is, is unique and, and compelling. And it's probably, as far as all of the events depicted in these various movies, it's the one that is still with us, that haunts us day and night. I think it's going to be shown on HBO for those who haven't seen it in the next couple of weeks. So, Andy, what do you think? Your, your pick here. Uh, you know, uh, like everybody else, I think this was a, a great field. And yes, there were things, uh, uh, Tales of the Grim Sleeper comes to mind as a documentary that did not get nominated. And there were several others. Uh, these films are kind of all good in different ways. And uh, I, I really appreciate that Citizen Four exists. But yeah, I didn't think of it much as a filmmaker film, which kind of diminished it for me a little. Uh, the one of these that made me want to call a friend and instantly you know, say, you've got to watch this one, was finding Vivian Mayer or Meyer, depending on what part of the film you're in. Uh, <laughs> which it just, uh, you know, I, my jaw dropped as soon as they started showing her photographs. And they're, they uh, were in, they're incredible. Yeah. If you haven't seen the film, they find this stash after she dies. Uh, at an estate sale of of thousands and thousands in photographs, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's all this undeveloped uh, canisters of film and and an extraordinary number of incredibly poignant and beautiful photos. Yeah, and I I mean I wish I could define what it is that you know the first photos come on the screen and you just go wow. That really is well. Great. They have a photographer who kind of explain the composition, the framing, how how people saw. But here's a woman who was a nanny. Mm -hmm. Not she didn't share any of the work. Everybody knew she took photos all the time, and filmed all the time. But no one ever saw the finished product. It's too bad that uh, the Ebert film Life itself wasn't nominated, or else you'd have an Ebert Siskel runoff. Since Charlie Siskel, Gene's son, is the co-director of Vivian Mayer. <laughs> Competing oh. against his dad. So, Andy, your pick, uh, best uh, doc. Uh, Vivian Mayer. Vivian, Vivian Mayer, okay. All right, let's move on. Uh, well, let's ask, for those of you who've seen, uh, let's say, at least three of the five documentaries, Citizen Four, Finding Vivian Mayer, Last Days in Vietnam, The Salt of the Earth, and Virunga. All right. Mm. Best, and you'll get a chance to see, uh, not all of them are even out, but you'll have a chance to see these, of course, very soon. Best Supporting Actor, the nominees, Robert Duvall for The Judge, Ethan Hawke for Boyhood, Edward Norton in Birdman, we saw him earlier, Mark R Ruffalo in Foxcatcher, and J.K. Simmons for Whiplash. Claudia, I see you ready to go. I, I'm not rushing it. I'm not dragging here. I, it's so clear who's going to win this, right? And I assure you, no one will slap you over your timing, so you're safe. He's J.K. Simmons is amazing in this role. I saw it at Sundance when it first came out a year ago and was blown away by the film, which I think is a really strong film, and I'm really glad to see it in the Best Picture category. It wouldn't, it's not necessarily my choice, but it's, it's definitely in my top ten. He's amazing. I mean, we've seen him in comic roles, we've seen him in Juno, we've seen him in TV, but this is a revelation. This, I mean, I, not that I don't think he was capable of this, but he is the, the consummate character actor. And this is such an interesting character. You are on the edge of your seat as you watch him. You're just completely tense. And unfortunately for everybody else, because it's, it's, you know, it's not a bad category, with the exception of Robert Duvall, who was kind of doing what Robert Duvall yeah. always does in that. But, you know, Ethan Hawke was fantastic. Ed Norton was was great. It, Mark Ruffalo was good, although I think Channing Tatum was better, but it, there's no question. It's, it's got to be Jake. Wade? I totally agree. I, I can't even watch those insurance commercials without going into a seizure. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it, it, it's one of, it is, it is one of the most effective supporting performances we've seen in years. And I'm, and I'm going to, I'm going to quote our, our LAFCA and KPCC colleague. The LA Ray, Film Critics Association. Yes, and, and our, also a KPCC colleague who does a lot of great off-ramps, Ray Green, who uh, kind of diminished it a little bit in saying, I liked it better when it was called the paper chase but which it is frankly the same kind g the same general structure but it, it, I prefer whiplash personally and I prefer JK Simmons to John Hausman who also won an Academy Award for that for that performance but they both do this the thing that great supporting performances are supposed to do which is 
elevate the film around them, make the leads better, give the film an, an aura that otherwise would not be there without them. And he is just, I mean, this is, this is a guy who's been a workman, uh, a journeyman for so many years. Nobody deserves just it more. Just 60. Nobody deserves it more. Yeah. Andy. Yeah. Uh, I, I find it odd that, uh, that J.K. Simmons is considered a supporting actor in this category. I mean, he was on screen almost as much as Miles Teller was. And yeah, he just ran away with it. Uh, he's almost always played sort of the nice, wry, older, you know, middle-aged man or something. And suddenly to see him playing an SOB was, was mm -hmm. really kind of bracing. But yeah, I thought uh, I, the others are they're all fine and all, but <laughs> but the four of them together, I think, are not as good. Peter, I, they're all going to the, they're I all going to the Oscars to basically celebrate J.K. Simmons' Oscar. <laughs> yeah. I think he's very Simmons is very effective, but you know, I, I think the movie itself is a crock, and I think that it. Um, In terms of it could never happen. I mean, what is this about? Tough love, tough hate, tough luck. Um, I mean, I've worked for bosses who are like him. Uh, I'm sorry. But, uh, <laughs> not you, Larry. Uh, the but I just think, I mean, it is, it is such a galvanizing performance that I think it sort of takes people on this trip to, to Nowheresville, and then you, you know, you're supposed to think that this is a great movie just because he's so riveting. But I think, you know, without him, the movie would be far less than it is. Uh, you know, I think uh, Duvall, you know, he's phoning it in, although he's using a landline and not an iPhone. <laughs> so it's old school performance. Uh, I like Norton. I think Ethan Hawke, uh, you know, he was interviewed recently. He said the director kept telling him not to act so much in Boyhood because if he, if he was being too actorly, it would, it would give away the fact that the movie has no plot. <laughs> um, I think Mark Ruffalo, for me, gave the best uh, you know, performance of the five. Marvelous performance, very subtle. Uh, the relationship that he has with his brother in that film is, is, is really, I think, the core of the film. People who say that movie has no heart haven't seen the film. All right. Let's ask uh, our audience here at the Egyptian Theater, Robert Duvall for The Judge, <laughs> Ethan Hawke in Boyhood, Edward Norton in Birdman, Mark Ruffalo in Foxcatcher, J.K. Simmons, Whiplash. <laughs> no big surprise there. All right, we're going to continue. We're coming your way from the Egyptian Theater, beautiful historic 1922 structure on Hollywood Boulevard, our 13th annual Film Week Academy Awards preview. We'll be back right after this news update. So time to see some more movies. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I would pick. So Eddie Redmayne, of course, is nominated for Best Actor. He's got, uh, I think, one of the biggest physical challenges an actor could have, which is to play physicist Stephen Hawking. The Theory of Everything is based on the book by Hawking's ex-wife, Jane. It details their life together, both before and after Hawking's disabling illness. So in addition to the two leads with Best Actor and Actress nominations, The Theory of Everything is nominated for Best Picture and two other Oscars. And just before we show the next clip, I mean, I know you guys always joke about playing someone with a disability is a huge, you know, advantage in, in getting an Oscar. Um, Tropic Peter, Thunder said it pretty well. Tropic Thunder, yeah, right. It set that, that whole thing up. I mean, yeah. Uh, what was the one Sean Penn had where he... Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I am Sam. Sam. I, am Sam. Yeah. I am Sam, yeah. So, yeah. so we've, seen, we've seen that before. Peter, were you going to say something? Well, yeah, I am Sam provoked that really sick line in Tropic Thunder where the actor was advised not to go full retard like, like Sean Penn did in I am Sam. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, so we're ready for the next clip. Clint Eastwood's American Sniper character study of Navy SEAL sniper Chris Kyle. Uh, Kyle was a very talented marksman, credited with the largest number of kills in Iraq. 
And the movie is adapted from his memoir, Bradley Cooper nominated for Best Actor. In this scene, Kyle's having a very difficult time adjusting to civilian life. He's gone to see a psychologist at the VA after he attacked the family dog when it started roughhousing with Kyle's child. Total of six Oscar nominations for Clint Eastwood's American Sniper. Okay, ready for our next segment of the program, which we're going to get into adapted screenplay, actress, and best motion picture. Gentlemen, all set? All right. From the 1922 Egyptian Theater in Hollywood, this is the 13th Annual Film Week Academy Awards Preview. I'm Larry Mantle with our critics Andy Klein, Peter Rayner, Claudia Puig, and Wade Major. Our next category is Best Adapted Screenplay, and here the nominees are Jason Hall for American Sniper, Graham Moore for The Imitation Game, Paul Thomas Anderson, who also directed Inherent Vice, Anthony McCartan for The Theory of Everything, and Damien Chazelle, who also directed Whiplash. All right, let's uh, start. Wade, do you want to lead off on sure. this one? I think there should be two winners in this category. I think uh, Chazelle should win for Whiplash for the best original screenplay nominated in the wrong category. <laughs> uh, why is it? Is it because he made this from his own short film? Yes. yes he, he, Just kind of weird, well, isn't it? it it's the, bizarre because the they're claiming that this is an adaptation because there was a short film that preceded it, but the short film was only one scene from the pre-existing screenplay. Which he wrote. Which he wrote, which was used as a proof of concept to raise funding for the film. The Writers Guild understood this. Somehow, Academy rules, which I've read, make absolutely no sense. So, uh, this, for some reason, Whiplash wound up shoehorned into the wrong category. Well, did here. he adapt himself well? He d adapted himself beautifully. Uh, incredible. It's it's a it's time travel actually because he he adapted himself from from a screenplay that existed before the thing that was adapted from it. If that even makes sense. Uh, you lost and me already. My my two choices here are my two favorite films of the year: uh, Theory of Everything and The Imitation Game. I love both those films. I love both those scripts. I think they're just superb. Um, it's really tough to pick between the two because they're different genres entirely. I think technically. The Imitation Game is the better screenplay, but in terms of emotion, I think The Theory of Everything is the stronger script. I, I wouldn't know how to choose between them. Okay, Andy. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go full on crazy on this one. Um, <laughs> I, we like that. Uh, Box look. trolls. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I really admire the craftsmanship that goes into biopics and things like that. I mean, I always think back to All the President's Men as this piece that, you know, this book that could not be adapted, plus everybody already knew everything that was going to happen, and it was still great. Uh, here, I, I admire uh, Imitation Game uh, pretty much more than, than, than uh, Theory of Everything, but God bless somebody adapting a Thomas Pynchon book, which is <laughs> unadaptable. And, and uh, it could only be Paul Thomas. It's about Anderson. inherent vice here, yeah. <laughs> I think it's yeah. incoherent vice. Incoherent vice, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was going to use that. <laughs> but I didn't feel that way. So. Claudia? Uh, oh, oh, go ahead. I'm oh, so no, handy. I was going to say, admittedly, it is a film that really, it helps if you've read the book. Uh, oh, yeah, and that's I'm sure not, it does. That's not a fair thing on some level. But I also just got so much pleasure out of that film, more than I got out of the book, in fact. And, uh, you know, sort of, I can imagine going back now for a third time. Wow, that's brave. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Claudia? I'm not there on that one. But, uh, <laughs> but, but when you're talking about adapting a book that is not on this list, I think Gone Girl, was, they did a really good yeah, adaptation yeah. of that. Yeah. Very true. I would like to have seen that on this list. I don't feel very excited about the things that are on this list. I, I guess I would go for Whiplash, even though it's not really an adaptation. I did like Imitation Game, fine. Um, uh, but... I just I almost feel like passing on this category. Yeah, okay. I'd rather do the original screenplay, which was Nightcrawler. I think that was an amazing script. Yeah. All right, uh, Peter. Yeah, I wasn't nuts about any of these um, as screenplays. I would probably go with Theory of Everything, just because I think, you know, everyone talks about it as being the Stephen Hawking's movie, but actually it's about the marriage. That's right. Uh, and Felicity Jones has just as an, an integral role in the film as, as Eddie Redmayne does, and, and I think that to the extent that the film balances that out and gets into some of the difficulties in the marriage and doesn't tie it all up in a neat ribbon, um, 
I think that would sort of get the edge. Uh, I, I love P.T. Anderson's movies, I, but I do think uh, Incoherent Vice <laughs> seems like a movie not only made about stoners, but made by stoners. You say and, that uh, like it's a bad four. thing. American, <laughs> American Sniper, I think, is, is, is a strong movie in, in many respects, but, but I do think it has like the fastest recovery from PTSD that I've ever seen in a movie. Yeah. All right, uh, so your votes for Best Adapted Screenplay, uh, American Snipers, Jason Hall. The Imitation Games, Graham Moore. Inherent Vices, P.T. Anderson. <laughs> the Theory of Everything's Anthony McCartan. And Whiplash's Damien Chazelle. All right. Next up is Best Actress, and the nominees here are Marion Cotillard for the Belgian film Two Days, One Night from the Dardenne Brothers, Felicity Jones for The Theory of Everything, Julianne Moore in Still Alice, Rosamund Pike from Gone Girl, and Reese Witherspoon in Wild. Uh, let's see, Peter, you want to start on this category? Yeah, I think far and away Marion Cotillard uh, is the best of the five. Um, but I, if I can just make a slight detour, she was nominated for uh, uh, Two Nights, One Day, um, and, uh, which is, a, right, which is a, a marvelous movie. Um, she's even better in a film called The Immigrant that was uh, essentially uh, sabotaged by the Weinstein Company um, over some uh, infantile peak about uh, Final Cut, and so the film was not promoted, there were no screeners sent out, no big ads were taken out, even after she won the New York and the National Society of Critics vote for, for that performance, as well as the Belgian film, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's, uh, you know, I think it, it's, it's rare that you have an actress give two really outstanding performances in one year. Um, it's unfortunate that I think the even better one in The Immigrant was not, was not noticed. Uh, I, don't, you, I don't understand, though. There's so much money involved in the film business, so infantile peak in such a big money business It, it, it happens. Film, I mean, you know, it, uh, the, a big ad was taken out for, uh, you know, other, other films. The Imitation Game, which is, which is also Weinstein, is, is getting, you know, quote ads from CEOs and captains of industry about if not for Alan Turing, uh, we would all be, you know, huddling in caves uh, doing, you know, cave paintings. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's fortunate that Weinstein isn't promoting uh, Exodus, the Ridley Scott movie, or we'd have quotes from God <laughs> saying that uh, we should vote for this movie because Moses gave us the Ten Commandments. Doesn't Harvey think he's God? <laughs> all, right. all right. Andy? You uh, can see Netflix, uh, uh, immigrant, immigrant on Netflix, by the way. Great. Uh, I, uh, I have to go with Rosamund Pike on this, and I, I don't know wh why Gone Girl, which got great reviews when it came out, and which I thought was an extraordinary adapted screenplay, because it's impossible material to deal with without spoiling everything, so I won't say what it spoils. But she had to do, uh, you know, a tricky, nuanced performance that you could then rewind, kind of, in your mind and look at, and get a totally different sense of who she and Ben Affleck were in the film. So I, I just thought it was great work. All right, Rosamund Pike. Uh, Wade. I, I think Reese Witherspoon suffers from not having Peter Fonda in Easy Hiker. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not on board there. I, I, I think Rosamund Pike has probably the most difficult performance, technically speaking, in terms of what that performance has to deliver. Uh, I have a great deal of technical admiration for it. Julianne Moore is very affecting. But I want to I want to point something out here, uh, based on on what uh, Amy and Lael were talking about previously, the paucity of great women's roles. There's an interesting inversion between this character, this category, and the Best Actor category. Of the five nominees in Best Actor, four of them are from Best Picture nominees. One is not. Of the five nominees in this category, only one is from Felicity a Best Picture Jones, nominee. Yeah. And, and which tells you that Best Picture nominees, the big pictures, tend to be male-centric, which is weird because in the 30s and 40s and 50s, you had a much greater balance of women's pictures, men's pictures, mixed pictures. And we're increasingly getting more and more male-centric with our, our big Oscar nominees. Which is and why we need more women writers and women directors. Which is a whole different conversation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's in that, but it's, 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 it's rather sad that here we are 70 years after a period which was considered anything but progressive as far as, as gender roles in society, and we've kind of gone backwards. And so I, I think this, this category is 
kind of should remind us of that. Um, my pick here would be Felicity Jones, uh, just because Felicity Jones could stand in front of a dark wall for two hours and and <laughs> and I'd be smitten. But I think I think she I think what she does here is not. They don't give her enough credit. Peter talked a little bit about this. Um, this is not the Stephen Hawking story. This is the story of a marriage. And because Hawking is an easy character to admire, but not a very easy character to like, our emotions flow through her. And that is an incredibly difficult burden to carry, especially when clearly he's the one that the light is shining on. She's in the shadows. She's in his shadow through most of this film, but she is our emotional heart. And it's a very subtle performance. It's it's, she's there's like, no look at me, look at me in this acting. And she, she has does. she has that magnificent classic doe-eyed combination of Joan Fontaine and Audrey Hepburn that just... Uh, it, there, there's just nothing like it. I wanted to see more of her, very frankly. I, I wanted to know more about her story because from what I had heard about that movie, um, Jane Hawking wrote a much angrier book and then sanitized it, and this movie was based on the sanitized version. So I would like to have seen that other one or just a, more of her because I think Felicity is a, great, is a really good actress. Um, but my pick here is Julianne Moore has been nominated five times. It's... Most of us think that she's already won. Has, yeah, has, she has She's not never won, won and yeah. she's wow. up there with Meryl Streep and, and you know the best of the best actresses. It's high time that she won, and this is an amazing performance, you know, and she does it in a very subtle way. I mean, it's, you Des know, describe it a little bit. She, it's still Alice, uh, adapted from Lisa Genova's book, and it's, uh, she is a professor of, I think, linguistics at Columbia, and she is, uh, she, come, she gets uh, early onset Alzheimer's at 50 years old. And so it's a very, it's, a, it's kind of a slow process, but you see this deterioration, and she does it so beautifully and subtly, and there's a really surprisingly kind of um, poignant relationship between her and Kristen Stewart, her daughter. I have never been a Kristen Stewart fan. You know, the lip chewing from Twilight is like in every movie, but she's, she's really good in this, and there's a great chemistry between the two of them, and I just think it's, I mean, it's it clearly, I think it's going to be Julianne Moore's year the way it's J.K. Simmons' year, but I think she deserves it. Having said that, I do think that Marion Cotillard was fantastic. She, is, Days, she was terrific. Uh, Two Days, One Night tells the story of a, of a factory worker who loses her job after she has a breakdown uh, because they're going to cut back on the number of workers. She's the one chosen not to, not to you know, keep a job so that everybody else at the factory can get a bonus. So she sets out, the film is all about her visiting all the other employees to try and get them to forego their bonus so that she can stay on and keep her job and make a case. It, it, is, it is a terrific film. It I, is. Very at powerful. least in my opinion. I, I, just, agree. I just thought it was a dynamite movie. Two days, one night. All right. Uh, well, let's uh, put it to you, members of the audience. For those of you who saw Two Days, One Night, Marion Cotillard. Felicity Jones, The Theory of Everything. Julianne Moore, Still Alice. Rosamund Pike, Gone Girl. Reese Witherspoon, Wild. All right. That's our vote on Best Actress. Next up, Best Motion Picture. Eight nominees, of course. They are American Sniper, Birdman, Boyhood, the Grand Budapest Hotel, The Imitation Game, Selma, The Theory of Everything, and Whiplash. Let's see, why don't I start with you, Claudia, your, your pick. Uh, it's a good thing there's a little separation between Wade and me here. <laughs> I'm going to get we're going to come to blows. We were on the show talking about boyhood when it opened. And Who plays J.K. Simmons in this? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be J.K., thank you. <laughs> I, I am so, I have been reviewing now for 14 years, and I have never been so affected and so moved by any film as I have by Boyhood. I've never, I was just blown away by this movie. I know people, some people call it a gimmick. Some people call it plot free. I don't, I mean, are our lives plot free? We're, it's, it's about growing up. It's about, you know, the process of aging. I don't think that's plot free. But I just think what Richard Linklater did was amazing. When I saw it up at Sundance, I was, 
I got on a bus afterwards and talked to someone and, and strangers were talking to each other and I thought maybe it's the altitude, maybe something isn't quite right here. <laughs> so then I saw it five more times, <laughs> just to make sure. And five I, more five times? Five more times. I've never it's seen- It's a two hour, 45 minute movie. I took a day and watched, you know, binge watched Boyhood over and over again. Um, I just think it's, it's an amazing landmark achievement and I, it just is so subtle. It, by focusing on those small moments, you get a sense of a lived life. I've never felt so close to somebody else's life. I think yeah. it comes the closest to capturing that. I think the performances are amazing. Uh, to me, there's just no choice whatsoever. That's the best picture. All right, Wade. I'm going to scooch over closer to Andy <laughs> so I don't get punched. Put him up. I, I, I am one of the... Look, I don't dislike uh, Boyhood. I don't, I don't dislike Birdman. I, I like both of them. I do, and I respect that both of them are pushing the envelope. They're trying to sort of enlarge... Our, our idea of what a movie is and how it's made, and I, I totally respect that. But you know, I'm I'm a classicist, and I if if somebody says to me, you know, I I'm, you have 12 years to make a movie, I will make you the greatest movie ever. But if somebody <laughs> says to me, I'm gonna you, hold you to that. But if somebody <laughs> says to me, you have 30 days to stage the march on Selma, Alabama, I'm gonna say no, thank you. I don't think I could do that. Uh, I, making a movie in a pressure cooker is what making a movie is all about. It's, that's the, the making of, that's the metal of, of a filmmaker. Uh, so which is why I'm glad to see that, that uh, Selma and uh, uh, American Sniper and uh, Theory of Everything all got nominated because they didn't get, their directors weren't nominated. So it's nice that James Marsh and Ava DuVernay and, and Clint at least got a little recognition in the best picture category. Um, but still for me, I mean, the best film of the year is The Theory of Everything. It touches my heart. It's like a George Cukor film from the 1940s. It, it just takes me back to everything that movies were when they were elegant and polished and, and dignified. And um, I don't think it's gonna win. I think Birdman's gonna win because that speaks more to the, to the Academy, but I'd go with Theory of Everything. Andy. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Birdman. Uh, and, and I went over this list a bunch of times uh, because things kept jockeying around. But when I was finally trying to put together a top 10, that was, of these, that was the highest up one. So by definition, I guess that is, that is my favorite. And it's, again, it's, it's one that I'm looking forward to the next viewing of again, because there's so much, I only saw it once and there was so much that I didn't realize was going on while it was happening. If I could point out something too, if Birdman does win, that will be the first time since 1980 that the Best Picture has not had an editing nomination. That's right. Peter. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm not a Birdman fan. Um, I uh, think it's unmagical realism, and, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't see what the big whoop de doo is about the simulated <laughs> one-shot movie. I mean, you know, from Rope to, to you know, Russian's Ark to, I mean, there's tons of movies. Gravity. That, Gravity, uh, you know, I mean, what's the big, it's not even integral particularly to the story to have it all in one shot, it's just a stunt. I think the, the, the critic that's in the movie in the bar, it's that scene is a preemptive strike against people like me <laughs> who don't like the movie. Um, I, I, boyhood, I think of these would be the one I would choose. Boyhood. I mean, it is a, st I mean, it is a stunt, but I think it's a transcendent stunt. And I think what the film is saying ultimately is, is very ironic and valuable, which is that the things that stay with you in life are the things that are supposedly transient. All right, real quickly, uh, vote. Well, in fact, we'll hold this for our next segment. Our audience vote, we'll hold it for that. We're coming your way from the Egyptian Theater, beautiful historic venue on Hollywood Boulevard, the 13th Annual Film Week Academy Awards preview, back with more with all of our critics back up on stage right after this update. See, my transcendent movie transcended your transcendent <laughs> All right, well, let's uh, bring up our, our other critics here, and we'll need to put, yeah, three of you on each of the couches. So the other thing I, we want to do at this point, those of you that want to ask a question of our critics, doesn't have to be a particular one, although that could be, or to the critics as a whole. Would you please come up here, auditorium right, follow the microphone, and we would love to have you line up there. We'll try and get as many as we can. We're only gonna have at most two of the critics answer to each of the questions so that we get as, as many of you as we can. Please make it something that you think is gonna be of interest to your fellow attendees that's not so specific, 
that you think it wouldn't transfer over to other people. So something that's just generally interesting that we haven't touched on so far in the program. Just line up here. And I'll be asking you your first name, where you're from, and then please go right into your succinct, just you know, right to the point with your questions so we can uh, do without having to edit this at all, which would be really nice. This, it's only Air Talk and Film Week audiences that you could even ask this of. That we, and every year we've been able to do it without having to edit the audience participation with no screening, no nothing, which to me is just remarkable and speaks to the, the caliber of listeners and, and audience members at events like this. So I hope you know how appreciated you are. I, I am so thankful for our audience every day. It just it makes it a real pleasure for me. Well, let's uh, turn our attention now. We got everybody up on stage. Can, can Henry, can you move forward a little bit without falling off the side of the stage, just so I can see you a little better? Is that possible? That way I can see the sneer so that, yeah. You, you asked the first question? No, that's for the audience. You can't. What are the 39 <laughs> steps? The 39 steps are bam, and then the shot rings out, well, right? Anna, if I, if I can ju jump in for just a moment and say that we critics come here not because of the lavish salaries KPCC gives us <laughs> or all the limos and perks, but because we enjoy working with Larry so much, who is the best of hosts. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And who, Thank you very who much. actually does his homework. When I was doing PR for one book, I could tell by the way they introduced the segment whether or not they had read it or not, and they usually hadn't. And you never catch Larry without having prepared. Not only do you prepare, but you love movies, too. And that I yes. love appreciate movies. That. I love it. Thank you. All and right, you love thanks. us, too. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, some of us. <laughs> I like your children. <laughs> But who's right. your favorite, Larry? <laughs> <laughs> now, now. <laughs> so let's, let's watch a couple more uh, films here. Uh, so Selma takes us back to 1965. The Civil Rights March, of course, from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. Movies directed by Ava DuVernay. In this scene, David Oyelowo as Martin Luther King tries to convince a pair of young local organizers of the wisdom of his strategy. And our final Best Picture nominee is one uh, we just heard a lot about, uh, The Imitation Game. And this one, of course, uh, has a number of different themes to it because uh, Benedict Cumberbatch plays the great mathematician Alan Turing, who's often considered you know, the father of computers as well. Uh, he was persecuted for being a gay man uh, after he made this extraordinary contribution uh, during the war to cracking the Enigma Code. In this scene in uh, the imitation game, he's been called in by the British government, crack the Enigma Code. Turing's uh, skeptical about the resources and the methods the government is going to use to do this job. All right, I think we're ready. We have our um, audience members and gentlemen, whenever you're ready. Did you say you were? Oh, I'm sorry, pardon me. All right, very good. Welcome back to the final segment of the 13th Annual Film Week Academy Awards Preview. We're at the beautiful Egyptian Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, our home for the show since we started it in 2003. And it's also part of our 30th anniversary of Air Talk. We're celebrating with listeners all this year, going out to communities throughout Southern California, taking the show on the road so that you can come out and join us. I hope that you'll take a look at our schedule at kpcc.org slash AT30. You'll see all the stops along the way, and I hope you'll join us in your local community. Well, it's time for members of our audience here at The Egyptian to ask questions of our critics. We've asked them to be concise, and, and then we'll take one or two uh, critic responses and try and get as many of these in as possible. Uh, sir, please, your first name and where are you from? Uh, I'm Ian. I live in Hollywood, but I'm from Colorado. All right. Great to have you with us. Your question. Um, so of the eight Best Picture nominees, 
Um, if you were to take one and swap it out for any movie you saw in 2014, so you have to get rid of one and then add one, what would you That's a good do? Question. Charles, um, Imitation Game and Princess Kaguya, uh, for me that was Turing for Dummies, that it never tells you how Turing breaks that code. Why is his machine revolutionary? What does it do? What is it that makes it significant? And Princess Kaguya is the most beautiful film uh, I would say probably anyone saw last year. Claudia. I would say American Sniper, out of there, lock in. Lock, okay. Henry, do you want to come to American Sniper's defense on that? Yeah, I, I think it's a shame it got caught up in all this kind of pseudo-political controversy. It's not, I mean, it's, it's not, the, the war in Iraq is the background to the movie. It, it's a character study. It's a classic Eastwood film about uh, a man who becomes dedicated to a cause uh, very frequently, as in this movie, a violent uh, cause, and then is caught unaware by, by the emotional or moral or spiritual uh, ramifications or consequences of that. Uh, I think it's an excellent movie. I think technically easily the best movie in the, in, of the year. Um, stupendous, stupendously made. Tremendous performance by Bradley Cooper, which we saw in that clip where you could see him going, you know, him trying to be stoic, but un with barely moving a, a muscle on his face. Hard to do what he did. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think it's a superb film. I, of, of the pictures nominated for Best Picture, I think it's easily the best picture. Okay, one more who would pull something um, and replace oh. it. Hold on, Charles. Okay. One, oh someone, yeah, yeah I don't know Tim? It's necessary to, re to remove anything because you, know, you get 10 nominations, but I, I, I'll, I'll say again, a most violent year, Oscar Isaac's film, directed by uh, J.C. Chandor. It's an extraordinary film and certainly ought to be nominated. Um, Imitation Game and Theory of Everything, because they're so classically made films, that's why I think I would probably take them out. It's not a punishment or anything like that. It's just that I, I, I you know, I, I, I think that you're doing it for their own good. Is well, yeah, there, needs be, there needs to be room. It's tough, tough criticism. <laughs> but yeah, J.C. Chandor's film, A Most Violent Year, I recommend it deeply. Yeah, Wade, you wanted to say something? Uh, I, I just say, for me, Boyhood Gone and uh, Most Violent Year In. They'll come after you I'm with torches, you. Wade. <laughs> All right, next, uh, next member of our audience. Sir, your first name and where are you from? Uh, Mike from Sherman Oaks. Great. Uh, to me, one of the really interesting races this year is cinematography, especially since for a change, all five nominees were actually photographed. And I wanted to know what your opinions were, and in particular, do you think this finally might be Roger Deakins' year? Yeah, Wade. Yeah, I, I think it is. Uh, as of last as of last year, uh, Emmanuel Lubetsky and Roger Deakins were the most nominated living cinematographers, not with a, with an Oscar. Uh, Emmanuel got his last year. I, I would be willing to bet, given what an amazingly gracious guy he is, he's probably been lobbying very heavily for Deakins to get his this year. And that's a there's a real fraternity among the cinematographers. So I'm my guess is that everybody kind of feels okay. Let's let's give Roger his due. And you know what? Wh it's which a, which it, film? I'm sorry, Wade. For which? for the Angelina Jolie film. Uh, the Unbroken, Unbroken uh, which uh, it's a beautifully shot film. Yeah, but I'll, Lubetsky I'll, deserves it for, for Birdman. You know what, they're just totally different efforts. I, I, well, it, Unbroken it, was such a dull movie. Well, let me put my vote in for Selma, <laughs> an absolutely gorgeously shot film. And the same, the same fellow who shot that film also shot A Most Violent Year, yeah. a film that I like a lot. I think maybe... <laughs> He's we're, not pushing we're get, that. We're getting a theme here, too. <laughs> not nominated for either of them. An also beautifully shot film, uh, New York in 1980, and just an extraordinary, the grit and the grime. Uh, this film just exudes. It, really, this is, this is just one of the most extraordinary films of the year, American Sniper notwithstanding. Ex excuse I, me, I excuse, excuse the ignorance of this being live action, but wasn't Mr. Turman, Turner nominated for cinematography? Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the movie was a bore, but it's gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, I don't you know. It's like a calendar. It's it beautiful, like but yes. you only have to look at a calendar for a month. Leo? Okay. Thanks. Um, I'm going to agree with Claudia. I actually think, even though Lubezki did win before, this is a tremendous achievement. I mean, the lighting challenges, the technical difficulty, the dexterity that was required to, to put together a film like Birdman with the seamless editing and just, you know, the in incredible amount of thought that had to go into that, I think it's a, a singular achievement. Amy, you have anything you'd switch out? Uh, 
No, not so much. I don't. I think Unbroken is very austere and beautiful in its own way. It's not my favorite Deacon's film, but if we're doing the Deacon sympathy vote, I have a zero problem with that. <laughs> All right. I think Mr. Turner uh, it is something of a bore, but it does look great, as Charles said, and it's one of the few movies I've seen about an artist where they try to, you know, consciously reproduce canvases of that artist where the, the images are dynamic, not just sort of static outtakes, you know, from, uh, from a gallery. All right, yes, please, your name and where are you from? Hi, my name is Aaron, I'm from West LA, happy 30th. Thank you very much. My favorite movie of the year was called Beyond the Lights, and I wondered if any of you enjoyed that. Yes, can oh, I jump in? Yeah, yeah, Amy's yeah. all like, yeah, go ahead. You and me, yeah. Beyond the Lights was one of my absolute favorite uh, films of the year, and one of the great pleasures of, at the end of every year, we do like, do, I don't know, if that, is that the one person who also saw this film? Is that's, the direct, yeah. that's the yeah. director yeah. of the yeah. film who's coming. Hi. Gina, Gina, Gina prince Bythewood, yes. are you here? I actually <laughs> saw this film because we were scheduled to go on that week, Larry. They, they barely promoted it at all. They barely showed it to any critics. They set up a screening, and it was only... Uh, the two of us, Henry, like, that were even in the room watching it. It's a great modern update of the, of the bodyguard that's even smarter. It's about a young pop star who is trying to re-identify um, what she stands for in a, in a um, MTV world that's gotten way too sexualized. It's just lovely. This is the sort of pop hit that I think should have been a huge blockbuster why, if, if, why, we were in the cinema, if we were in the world of 20 years ago. Why do you think it didn't, it didn't get more traction? It wasn't promoted. Nobody paid any attention to it. It's, I've known so many people who have come up to me and said, I heard how great it was at the end of the year when everybody was talking about it, and it was already out of theaters. The it's lead actress in Mabatha Ra, too, yeah. who is really a good actress. She was also and in Bell this year. Yeah, she was yeah. also in Bell. And it was also written and directed by a woman. We're talking about more films that should be. Gina Prince Bythewood also did Love and Basketball. She's really good. I it's think the most something. violent year was getting all the attention that week. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm sorry, the, the title of the film again for people who want to catch up to it's it now. Beyond, Beyond the, the lights. lights. And it's out on VOD, VOD on February 18th, which I know because I've had so many friends come up to me and say, can we have a watch party? Because everybody's dying to see it. It's, but it, to me, this speaks to the idea that we are not knowing how to market the good films even when we have them. There's just such a glut of good, really smart films, and we, we talk about how we don't have enough good films for actresses, but the problem is some of the ones that we have just aren't even getting seen, and nobody knows they exist, and audiences who love them aren't even finding out about it till it's too late. All right, next, uh, yes sir, uh, your first name, where are you from? Yeah, I'm Jim, I'm from Pasadena, and I guess my question's in the same line as that. Uh, my favorite film last year was Calvary, Mm, and I just loved it. Film. It moved me so yeah. much. Brendan Gleeson, fantastic yeah. film. Yes. I You're absolutely right. Um, he should have been up for Best Actor. Yeah. Yeah. Very he easily could have been. Alfred film that Steve Carell in with talking him. About. It came out a little bit early in the year, and we, st we just stopped talking about it. It actually, it wasn't that early. It was like late summer or something. Yeah. And earlier I, thought, I thought he was a shoe-in. Yeah. I for, always for, think Brendan Gleeson is, is a shoe in yeah. for best it's, actor, it, it's and true. he never he never gets in. The, no. I, the, the, general, the general, the John Borman picture, yeah. he was brilliant. Uh, it's sharp in Bruges. In Bruges, one of the best movies ever. But there's yeah. there's obvious there's always. All right, been, that's it. We'll establish the Brendan Gleeson <laughs> honorary <laughs> lifetime. There's, there's all, it's always been tougher for redheads. <laughs> uh, like Julianne Moore being nominated and never winning, and Brendan Gleeson never being nominated. Jessica, Chast Jessica Chastain would disagree. One. Archie uh, Andrews. So one. let's back up for just a yeah. moment. So, this film that you all clearly like and Gleeson's performance, Tim, do you want to tell it, us it, what it's about? It's an outstanding film. It's a film about a priest, a man who came to the priesthood late in life. He'd already had a family and children, but he's been a priest for 30 or 40 years. He gets a phone call from a parishioner, from someone who says that I'm going to kill you for a reason. And over the course of the film, he's trying to figure out who, who this person is who has called him. The reason why he's being persecuted, and this is the reason why I think this film is fantastic, is because he is a good man and an even better priest. Uh, he's good, and it's his good, goodness that's going to bring him, de bring him low. It's a fantastic film, a fantastic performance, and probably could have been nominated for Best Screenplay, too. And it says a lot about the... Catholic Church in Ireland at this moment. Yeah. Um, the Catholic Church in general, but a lot about what's The going weight on. of all of that, the yeah. childhood abuse. It's, it's a all wonderful that. performance. It's a wonderful film. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, next up, uh, go right ahead. Well, this is me again. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> my question is <laughs> <laughs> Will there ever be a category for smaller films or independent films because they all get washed away and pushed away by big money and promotion, it seems? 
Well, the, what, what we have now really are just independent films. I mean, for, for the, I know it's not the, we have different tiers of independent films, but for the last decade, the Oscars have been dominated by independent films more than at any other time in their history. For the last decade, we've only had two studio films, both of them from Warner Brothers, that was Argo and The Departed. And if you, I mean, studio Gravity. film. Gravity. Well, but for Best Picture. Best Picture, I'm saying. Oh, I see. Okay. You know, it it, it, I mean, uh, you know, 20th Century Fox hasn't had a Best Picture winner since Titanic. Uh, Columbia hasn't had one since the 80s with Gandhi and the Last Emperor. Uh, Paramount hasn't had one since they won back to back in 94, uh, 94 and 95 with uh, Forrest Gump and Braveheart. The studios simply don't make Oscar winners anymore. Now it's just all indies. It's a higher tier of indie, but it's all indies. So but the studios actually, just no. do the, the superhero films. This is um, they, they value the Oscars tries. less. Well, it's, that's what you see. You don't see Guardians of the Galaxy in there. I mean, that was a um, big studio This film. is actually where animation, I think, has been kind of leading the pack because you look back at. Uh, Triplets of Belleville, Secret of Kells, Song of the Sea, Princess Kaguya. Um, th these are films, I'm not sure about Princess Kaguya, but the first ones had budgets of maybe 12 to $15 million. And they can produce a quality film on that and be recognized against you know, the, the work of Pixar and Disney and DreamWorks that are budgets close to 10 times that. So we are getting some independence in that rather um, forlorn category. Well, one reason why the, the Oscars expanded the Best Picture uh, nominees to 10 maximum instead of the previous five was because, uh, you know, non-studio uh, boutique movies were winning all the awards and that was not helping the ratings for the Academy show. They wanted, you know, films that, that were big audience pleasers in there, so they expanded it uh, to 10 in, in the hopes that they would get more films like Avatar in there. But yeah, his wait. point is interesting oh. because, it, I mean, the really small films, like Whiplash, there's one. We saw Beast of the Southern Wild, there was one. You know, for the really, really low-budget films, you don't see them in, in the mix for Best Picture as much as you see the Fox Searchlight, the Sony Pictures Classics, those kind of which, which is films. why the IFP awards exist. I, yeah. You know, what, what's interesting here is that this run really begins in, in 2005 when Crash won. That was the beginning of this, this indie period. And, and it's it, been uphill it, from there. Well, <laughs> it coincides, but this is interesting. Well, it it coincides with that love. moment when all the specialty divisions were, were canned, Paramount Classics and Miramax and, and Picture House and Warner Independent, when basically the studio said, we're not interested in being in, in, a part of this anymore. And that rage is partly what has contributed to this independent streak, but what's also, I think, gonna push Birdman over the top, because Birdman is essentially a film about the rage against studio films, a man who says, I'm tired of being associated with this stupid superhero, I wanna get back to my, the purity of my roots in the theater. That speaks to the rage that continues to be a part of the creative community ever since the, the ind independent divisions were Leo? distinguished. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there starts to be in a way kind of a, um, an arbitrary or almost like amorphous distinction in some ways with the um, studio versus indie because there are indie films that are more like studio films and there are studio films that are more like indie films. So it's not, I don't think that's what we need to be discussing. I think we need to come back to Amy's point of there are little gems like Beyond the Lights that need every bit of attention and marketing push they can get and whether it's viral marketing or you know social media marketing or us going on air talk and saying you know you, you know you need to you need to see this film tell your friends about it make sure you know make sure you you find it if it's on demand I mean find the films and tell people yeah, and they'll get out there. There's a little one called uh, A Most Violent Year. <laughs> <laughs> so did, did, all right, where's the like hook, that, Tim? <laughs> Turn movie. into a movie. Yeah, yeah, Henry, hold on, hold on, Henry, yeah. Well, for, first of Briefly, all, the, Henry. the yeah. big studios, uh, this is the second year in a row, Paramount has had a, bi a Best Picture uh, nominee. Uh, it's Selman, last year it was Nebraska. They're going to do other areas of the country as they go along. <laughs> and it, it, I can't excuse, wait for excuse me for being cynical about what an independent movie is. Focus is part of Universal. You know, um, uh, Fox Searchlight, Sony Classics. You can go on with these. And I, I, I happen to know for a fact that sometimes major studios fund movies through the independent companies so that they don't have to pay uh, union crews. So there are more studio movies out there than you think. But right, the studio I, I want to give... Oh, I just want to give those that were on the first panel a chance to choose their favorite film out of the eight nominees. So, uh, 
Uh, let me start with you. Tim, your pick, best picture. Uh, uh, Birdman, still at the top of my list for best picture. Okay. Leo? <laughs> Pro probably Birdman. All or, right. Or Budapest. Henry? American Sniper. American Sniper. Amy? I'll very confidently say Grand Budapest. Grand Budapest. And Charles? Um, I'd say Boyhood, and, but that's kind of by default. Okay. <laughs> All right, here's a chance for you, the audience. You're going to vote for the best picture of 2015. American Sniper. Birdman. Grand Budapest Hotel. The Imitation Game. Selma. The Theory of Everything. Whiplash. Boyhood. All right, there you have it from our audience at the Egyptian Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, our 13th annual Film Week on Air Talk Oscar preview. My thanks to all nine of our great critics. You guys are great. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming out from all of us at Air Talk. Have a wonderful afternoon. BBC News Hour comes up next.